I don't know how to narrate things. I don't know how to speak. I'm very shy. I've always been behind the scenes guy. I can't speak. When I see a camera in front of me, I freeze. I freeze. I freeze. I freeze. Viewers and listeners, we're back with another episode of Side by Side with myself, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. Today, we're going to go behind the scenes of Firnas, what went on, and we will try to answer some questions. Is there anything that you wish they hadn't shown in the documentary? There's loads of stuff. After signing up, then I realized, oh no, what, did, what is this? Not now, I am seriously exposed in front of the camera and I have to give them access to certain things. The producer knew where they were taking this documentary, but I didn't. I, I was too late to realize pressure was on. Abdul mentions, if you give me a hundred thousand pounds, I can start you in the airline. <laughs> Look, even he shouldn't have said that. You can't. He didn't know what he was talking about. Viewers and listeners, we're back with another episode of Side by Side with myself, Kazi Shafiqur Rahman. Today, we're going to go back and continue with our second part of Fernas and the behind the scenes of Fernas, what went on, and we will try to answer some questions. Before we begin, I have one massive request. Please subscribe to the channel so we'll be the first to know as soon as a video drops. I'll hand it over to my colleague to fire away with the questions. So a massive part of your Fernas journey was the documentary you did with Channel 4. How did the Channel 4 documentary come about? So, with uh, any businesses, you, you, you do need PR, you need publicity. With Firnas, one thing that was good was anything related to aviation, it automatically attracts some sort of attraction, if not from the media, but at least from the people around you, because it's just so crazy and so big and so ambitious. So people just automatically want to know, like, you know, who is this? Who, like, wh how dare he try to think such a thing? And then they start following you and then they want to know more about what, you got, uh, what you're doing. They want to see if you're crazy or if, you are, if, you, if you're up to something. Having said that, I did want to generate lots of PR. I did want to get featured on press. I did write to so many journalists so i would go to daily mail or i would go to google and find out who's written about such a um, such a thing like you no know, startups particularly in aviation so i'd contact those journalists and say hey would you write a piece on my startup aviation startup it was all no 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 throughout the process what i heard was no and there was some aviation forums and hubs that wrote some contents but it wasn't really kind of credible it wasn't it's just like a forum you know anyone can write anything what happened was when we so every business needs a story so we asked ourselves what is the story of Firnas what is it that we're trying to do and how are we going to position it in the market so there is an edge to it there is an angle to it and it's not just another company so we thought, well, I'm quite religious and I value my religion very dearly. You know, it's very close to my heart and everything that I do and everything that I have done, it always had this kind of Islamic angle to it. So in our other businesses, you know, we never used any bank loans. We never used any interest. We never um, used certain things. We abstained from any form of riba and that worked really well so i thought you know what maybe carry on with that same concept because clearly it's worked and clearly you know allah wouldn't be unhappy god wouldn't be unhappy about it however if you do the other way then he will be unhappy somewhere i don't know where it's written but it's written somewhere take you using Usury or dealing with riba is like declaring war with Allah. So it's, it's a major thing. So I thought carry on with that. But instead of shying away from it, we call ourselves Sharia compliant. So how is it Sharia compliant? You know, we're not saying 
the cabin crew have to marry the captain and the pilot to be able to kind of fly away. Um, it was more on the principal side of things. It was more about how we dealt with things, how we approached things. When it came to finances, when it came to dealing with customers, when it came to fairness, you know, we try to incorporate Sharia element. So the way I see it, Sharia compliant is not Sharia enforcement. But when we say when when someone hears Sharia compliant, they think Sharia enforcement. I am not shoving something down your throat. I'm just doing something that is a, that is compliant to a certain principles, which are very good, very ethical, very fair. So we announced it as such. So the story became Sharia compliant airline in Britain, which was completely kind of opposite to each other. Britain, and then you got Sharia compliant airline, which is hugely, hugely kind of, it's got a huge sex appeal to it. It's just one of those industries that has been kind of designed in that way, where cabin crews and, you know, staffing are used to express the brand. And generally they, they involve a lot of sex appeal. So we thought <laughs> that's another extreme. So airline and Sharia compliant. So you've got three extremes here that's coming together. And I think that was the kind of magic combo for, for media. And then um, I got one uh, feature on a magazine. And then what I done, I, after the interview with that magazine, so it was a halal friendly magazine. There was an event happening in Dubai and then we took part in the event. And as part of the package, they done an interview with me. And I realized actually this person who's writing the article, she's a journalist. And she seemed to be doing like, you know, other work for other people as well. So let me speak to her and see if she would be up for, you know, doing some work with us and narrate our story and help me narrate the story better. Before that, I had a friend who's, who's massively into PR and brand development. He's really, really come in and helped me shape my thinking. So every Sunday would meet up in our old warehouse. I'm sure people have seen in the documentary we'd meet up in the warehouse. And now just to kind of put a context to everything, I am, I don't know how to narrate things. I don't know how to speak. I'm very shy. I've always been behind the scenes guy. I can't speak. When I see a camera in front of me, I freeze. So that friend of mine, Alhamdulillah, I was, so everyone, every time I asked, every, every time I talked about Firnas, like any suppliers, anyone, they said, what do you do? Like, what is it? And I couldn't explain like what I was doing. So this friend, he really kind of, we worked on, on, on um, clarifying what is it that we're trying to do. So he helped me massively. And then we would time ourselves. I would even memorize presentations. Like if I need to re record a video, I would re like memorize the whole script because that's the only way that I could deliver. And I still went, went blank when I saw a camera in front of me. So message was important and then uh, that person Gemma um, I said to her look would you help me and then she agreed to help and then what, what would happen is every time we had something going on we'd do a little article and she would like blast it out across her like um, network of media companies mainly based out in Dubai and, and Middle East because Sharia compliant resonated more in that part of the world. And it was very natural and it was very normal. In Middle East, Sharia compliant is the way. Here, in this part of the world, it's, it's quite an extreme thing, probably because of all the, all the negativity associated with Sharia law and everything. So, on one occasion, um, Gemma said, look, um, Bloomberg in Dubai, they want to interview you guys and they find what you guys are doing quite crazy and interesting the fact that it's an airline industry that's sharia compliant that is supposed to be sharia compliant and it's based in britain so i said like, yep let's go let's do it i'm always like at that time even now my attitude is let's commit and then we'll find a way to you know figure we'll, we'll figure it out so we agreed to do the article um we done the interview at no point in the interview, we mentioned halal or sharia or, or any of those words. These were still internal kind of 
evaluations and exercises that we were going through. We had never told anyone it's going to be Sharia compliant at that point, up until Bloomberg point. And then um, the journalist, her name is Dina, she, she interviewed us and um, we mainly talked about the premiumness and you know how we're going to enhance the service offering. We're going to serve unserved and underserved destinations, more on a business kind of angle. We, we spoke about the business side of the business as opposed to the PR side. But what happened, she wrote the article anyway, and it was Sharia compliant or Sharia airline to take off from Britain. That was the title. I think the article is still there somewhere in, uh, on, on, on the website, so if, anyone, if anyone wants to Google it up. So that went on and, and I thought, you know what, this is not right. Like, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not comfortable yet. I haven't kind of internalized the whole kind of story, the, the Sharia aspect. And then, do you know, I thought there was one point I said, I was thinking like, you know what, we need to speak and we tell them to readjust the title as we've done with some other ones later on. Um, and then another part of me was saying, do you know what, who cares? Leave it there. Leave it. So we went with, with the leaving. Um, we, we just left it. Let the article go. And um, normally these companies, people like Bloomberg, they are very kind of reluctant to you know, change things because you said so. Um, but our point was, it's not accurate. We haven't said it in the interview. So don't make it up. Um, but we left it there and then we carried on doing what we were doing, route development, research, business planning, you know, wh whatever was required at that time. And then suddenly we get this guy um, tweeting us and messaging us and right, left and center from all angles. So he can get our attention because he saw an article as he later described on Bloomberg that you guys are trying to launch a Sharia airline and we're interested to know more about what you guys are doing. So that person, um, he, he's a producer of, of documentaries and he produces documentaries for the likes of BBC's and oh, wow. Channel 4 and you know other, other companies. So he's an independent guy who works for an independent company who make documentaries and then they sell to the likes of Channel 4 or they get it funded based on the idea. So for him, the idea was kind of very strange or may, maybe something that was very different and crazy. And he wanted to know, like, you know, what, what, what's all that about? And he said, look, we wanna, we're thinking about doing a documentary with you guys and following your journey. Are you guys interested? I said, yes, we are. <laughs> Like this is the best could ha thing could happen. Like, come on, a documentary, documentary on TV based on what you're doing. That's amazing. And at that point, I'm still a very shy guy. I don't know what I'm signing, uh, signing myself up to. And uh, we said, yep, no problem. They invited us to their headquarters um, in Shepherd's Bush somewhere. And they wanted to know more about, they wanted to assess like, are these guys just like waffling or is there some substance to what they're saying? I think we managed to somehow convince that we were going to do this anyway, you know, with or without anyone. And I think that's the vibe that they got. And then they said, look, we are still very interested and we want to do this. And um, we'd love to start off with a small master interview. I didn't know what a master interview was, but I thought, okay, no problem. Let's do it. So we done all the paperwork, they gave us all the paperwork, we signed it off and um, I guess what the paperwork meant is, you know, if we signed up to it, they own the contents and everything and there, there is no coming back to it. So the master interview took place and I was like sitting in front of a camera and thus um, in the documentary is where I'm um, sitting in front of the camera and I'm talking about the, the first segment of the, of the documentary where I'm uh, with three uh, roller banners behind me this is the first master interview in commercial road office. And, and I was blank. I, I went blank. I was like, I don't know what I'm saying. What, what do I say? You know, but the beauty is that these producers are so good with getting you to talk is amazing. And they made me talk. I didn't realize after a while that there was a camera in front of me. So I became more and more used to it, more and more kind of used to it. The pressure was on that day. And I could feel myself sweating in front of like a camera and a producer and his team of people. 
So that was the beginning of the documentary and um, we've done filming here and there but I wasn't really, I don't know, I just, although we signed up to it but I, I just kind of kept on blocking them from seeing certain things because I don't think I was quite comfortable with them seeing it. What do you mean bl um, blocking them seeing Like I wouldn't invite them to certain meetings, I wouldn't take them to certain places because these are the first this is the first time I'm meeting those people and I don't know like because if it's a business discussion then it needs to be a business discussion you can't you know put people off by bringing a camera crew with, crew with you but I think what they've done they realize like we're trying to you know Orchestrate block, it yeah we're trying bit. to block them out in some way is that authentic though if you're showing a documentary should it not be about the realities of life. It What's is, but like I business? said, I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable. I was, I, I really wasn't comfortable. I didn't know after signing up. Then I realized, oh no, what, did, what is this? You know, now I am seriously exposed in front of the camera, and I have to give them access to certain things. But um, luckily, they brought in a guy, a Muslim guy, who's a who's a director, who's a junior director. His name is Ahmed, and they kind of put us in touch together. And I think. At that point, I became a bit more comfortable with, with opening up a bit more. Do you think they planned it a little bit? I don't know if they did, but I think it's just a coincidence the way it happened because Ahmed was, he's still a rising kind of talent in the creative industry. And I think he approached them and they probably thought, well, that's amazing. You know, you can handle this Perfectly project. Perfectly matches yeah. well. And um, I think at that point, I became more and more comfortable. I kept on talking to Ahmed more and more. And, you know, it re it made me feel like it's not malicious. You know, they're not wanting, you know, Channel 4 had a reputation of, you know, framing things in a Having certain way. Having their narrative. Yes. Yeah, so I think that was the scary part. And people kept on telling me, oh, my God, this is Channel 4. Like, oh, my God, like you got to be careful, you know. It, they might, you know, make you look bad, and and I guess that's what that's what that's, that was one of the fear. Is that the reason there were certain things you weren't showing them? I think of... so. I think so. It's a fear that I might it might get twisted along the way, and it might be used in in the wrong way. So yes, I did become quite anxious at some point, and then I think as I did it more, as I filmed more with them. Um, they, uh, I became more more comfortable and I became more of a media person. Is there anything that you wish they hadn't shown in the documentary? There's loads of stuff that I wish they hadn't they they, they haven't they hadn't shown. Um, but I guess that's just TV. It's it's a reality documentary. It's based on reality, and and this is what I've signed up to. So it's it's important that they capture the essences of the journey. So, yes, there are certain things that I forgot that I said uh, right towards the end of the documentary, but it was too late then. Could you give us an example? So, what can I say? Um, one of the, I think that's me jumping way ahead. Um, but one of the things that I said was um, my investors would, would, you know, would, would not appreciate such and such. But and then I realized, oh no, this is this is going on the camera, and and you know when you're too friendly with the crew, you kind of just open up and you ooze out information, and that's what was happening. And they're such so good at, you know, um, what's that word? Probing. They get information out of you, and I guess they're professionals. That's their job. That's how they do it. So, yes. Um, after the master interview and then they had to pitch that documentary as well they had to pitch so the, it was a private company that took on the job and they had to go and pitch to various um, news channels or, or, or tv companies and one of them had to kind of bite and it was channel 4 that bit and the way it worked is they have to invest in the film so channel 4 had done their own due diligence to see like if this is going to really take off if there is any substance to this documentary because they don't want to waste like 250k or so in some filming some random dude and then it just goes to waste was it just channel 4 were there any other bigger there might have been some other people but i think channel 4 found it more interesting and i think the the commissioner in channel 4 um i'm not sure i've never met her in person but she she i think found it quite interesting the the the, the whole concept the fact that i think she was from also bame community 
I'm from BAME community and I thought she was she, she probably wanted to showcase something along those lines. So yes, they made a film, a short film based on the master interviews and based on some of the kind of events that we've attended, like the air, air show in Farnborough and they put a little um, teaser together and then they presented to Channel 4 and then Channel 4 said, yeah, we're, 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 we're buying. How and does that feel, being the star of your own documentary? It, it's it's so strange. Wallahi, it's so strange because I have never been a media guy and building Sunnah Mas to a certain point, I've always maintained that kind of behind the scene approach. I've never come to the fore, foreground. I've never kind of come to the... Um, I've never shown myself. It was always kind of the company first, brand first, and then who's behind the brand is, is irrelevant. So it was a completely different... Uh, from from the other business that I was doing. So it was a huge responsibility, huge, huge responsibility. But I guess I'm sure we'll, you'll ask some questions. Um, that responsibility did create pressure, that which meant I had to carry on with certain activities. Okay, so you're filming the documentary. What sort of things did you learn from the documentary about PR? Unfortunately, it was too late by the time I learned how the PR game worked. Uh, one thing I've learned, you have to give a story that people want to write about. Because journalists, they're not here to promote your brand. They're here to write a story that will be read by people and that will, be a, that will get engagement. Just like social media, it's all about engagement. You know, newspaper companies are looking for stories that will sell, that will generate interest. So you have to kind of position yourself in such a way where they want to write about you. It's not just a case of, hey, you know, would you write a story about me and, and it will benefit me? No, it, it has to work two ways. It has to benefit you and it has to benefit them. It's a 50-50. Is that the reason you played on the Sharia component? I don't so think much? We, we purposely did it so that we can get the media interest. It, that was a byproduct, the media interest. We realized, oh no, like, amazing. Like, this is what the journalists want to write about and we've just given it to them fantastic happy days so i guess that was the biggest takeaway for me was give a story if you're a brand give a story to to narrate and i'm sure newspaper companies will want to write about it because they're looking for stories they're not looking to promote anyone if you want to promote then you have to pay for the advertisements and you know adverts um and i guess the second thing was um the questions that are asked are very well researched questions. Generally, and politicians do that so well, they never answer any questions. So I realized whatever I was answering, I was just kind of feeding into the picture that they were looking to make in behind the scenes because I, I didn't know what the end, end outcome is going to be about, but the di director knew, the producer knew where they were taking this documentary. But I didn't. I, I was too late to realize that some of the questions are very well researched and they are there to get certain answers. And I kept on just answering as it is. But then I la later realized that wasn't a too, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad either because the genuineness came across, the sincere element. So I didn't make anything up. You just, it does was it what it says on the tin. And that was me. I want to speak to stick to the aspect of it being Sharia compliant. So ten minutes into the documentary, you're already reevaluating: should you still be doing this? Is it going to be acceptable to the broader public? Why did you go back on it? On your words about being Sharia compliant? Um, Sharia compliant. Uh, we we realize it's, it's it's becoming more of a challenge than than good. It's like trying to fight a battle that, that is so hard to win because aviation is just so, it's an industry that's very close-knit. Everyone know, knows one another. Each executive would know another executive somewhere, somewhere else. Each authority will know another authority. So it's all interconnected around the globe. If someone is big shot in, in aviation, then the rest of the aviation community knows. It's like football football fans and i think aviation fans share similar kind of traits it's a very close-knit emotional 
um, sentiment with, with aviation. Once you're part of aviation community, once a bug gets in you, you're in for life. So we realized it's presenting us more challenges and more hurdles to deal with rather than dealing with the already enormous business challenges. So we thought, let's maybe try to reposition. And we started getting some hate as well around it. And we thought, you know what, we need to run a business, not a political campaign or something. If that's the case, shouldn't you have stuck to core business principles in terms of using the PR, in terms of starting the airline? Why play on that aspect of it? Like I said, we didn't play on it. It just happened. It happened because Bloomberg, we haven't said anything to Bloomberg. They just wrote. They just kind of assumed and we just left it there. And then on the back of that, that Channel 4 documentary came. And then uh, when we realized that it's actually presenting a challenge, that's when we thought, no, we need to reposition. And I think at that point as well, a lot of things happened as well from our kind of business journey point of view. So where we were going for straight, big, long haul operation, that was the ambition. And then as such, we were looking for big investors who will fund that big ambition, which is around, you're talking about 50 to 100 million that you need to start off with. So I was meeting various investors around the world, including China, Beijing. I met the owners of H&A Group. The, these guys, the Chinese conglomerate, they own Ritz-Carlton Hotel, they own Radisson, they own so many. They even um, own um, aircraft leasing companies in Ireland. They own transportation companies. I don't know if you guys know, there's a company called TIP. They also own that. It's, you, if you go on motor, you'll see like on the back of the lorry, there's H&A logo. So we reached out to H&A Group. At that time, they wanted to buy Monarch Airlines, uh, which was on the brink of collapse. And we thought, well, if these guys are wanting to invest in something like that, then maybe they have some interest in the UK and a UK entity. Let's approach them and let's go and meet them. So I, I went out to China. I met them. I met the, via, uh, the vice president of the group. Very nice guy, very gentleman, you know, uh, made me very comfortable. He showed good signals that they wanted to do something in the UK. And then we were going through Brexit at that time as well. So the whole Brexit campaign was happening. There was a lot of instability. So I think when we came, so H&A Group, they kind of explored, they said, give us a business plan, blah, blah, blah. We've done all of that. And then uh, just after Brexit, I think a few days after the Brexit, they send us an email saying, yeah, we're not, uh, we're not going to consider this at this minute. Do they give any feedback? So they've considered your proposal, your deck. What sort of feedback did they give you? They just said that our circumstances have changed. I think that's a quite a common answer amongst investors when they just don't want to disclose, like when they don't want to bother too much. So their circumstances have changed. I assume it's probably either our business plan wasn't good or the Brexit um, made them think, do we really want to invest, you know, 50 to 100 million in, in a startup company um, in the UK? So I thought maybe that could have been, an, been a reason. And at that point, when we went from the long haul, we flying to unserved and underserved destinations, um, we came down to European regional operations and European regional and Sharia compliance doesn't really kind of, fit even even as a kind of story even as a kind of it's not something that you should i guess um talk about in the public because that might put people off instead of considering you so we realized maybe yes you remain sharia compliant under under the hood you know keep it sharia compliant but you don't need to sh scream and shout about it because you're just creating your own more problem for yourselves shouldn't you've taken that as a hint these people are experienced in this industry they have loads of funds to play with probably more money than you probably have at your disposal. Shouldn't you have taken it as a hint? Okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. They're not willing to take the risk. Why am I doing this now? I think with fundraising or investment raising, you know, you have to speak to loads of people. You know, if you speak to 100 people, if you get through the door, then maybe few will show interest and, and maybe none of them will invest at the end. So 
the 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 fundraising game is a very any any founder any entrepreneur will 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 concur that fundraising is not is not a fun game it is hard because you're emotionally charged you're emotionally involved because you want it to work you want it to get funded and when you when you get rejected again and again and again you you kind of go back and say well we'll try again we'll try with someone else maybe someone else will 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 um, invest in it so yes we came down from the long haul ambition to the regional ambition we thought well maybe let's scale it down to something a bit more manageable because 50 million and 100 million is these are big figures unless of course i ran an aviation company before i was a ceo of a maybe small company aviation company then i think the fundraising would have been way easier because people would have thought well they would have seen from my track record actually he's done it before or he's run this company so he's got we can risk that money with with this person i want to quote something from your documentary so one of your close advisors Ad, abdul mentions if you give me 100,000 pounds i can start you an airline how does that sound to you today uh, look even he shouldn't have said that you can't you can't you just simply can't he didn't know what he was talking about and he knows he didn't know what he was i think he just said it out of emotion out of banter because you know sometimes we 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 used to joke about it as well but i think he kind of lost um control of what he was saying at that point because you cannot god you can't even buy a wheel maybe with 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 100k but is this the type of person you should be taking with you and helping you start your airline i think um along the lines i've i've found many red flags that made me realize actually i need to maybe think like who do we have in our team you know team was a big aspect and it was very difficult to recruit team i mean abdul abdul was great at what he did like he was i i think he was more of a commercial person than 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 planning person because he was always coming up with unique and innovative ideas as opposed to more about the planning i mean he was he knew what we what we needed to do but we needed someone else to i guess assist in getting the idea across on onto paper do you think to a certain extent abdul was stroking your ego a little bit this is him going from doing uh, mini cabbing to now being part of an airline i don't know look i was a i was an aircraft cleaner at at one point so I don't know. I think I think we we had a good relationship. That's all I can say. We we had a very good relationship and you know along the way we enjoyed very good moments. We traveled together and he was an amazing guy to travel with. So I suppose everyone has a life story and and I don't know what his internal story is, but I don't think, you know, them doing a particular job in their previous life has anything to do with the future success because could happen if it could happen for me and nobody to now trying even trying to to launch an aviation company is is quite different so i don't know but i probably wouldn't i wouldn't want to talk too much about abdul because i think people got the gist that yeah he's he's and i don't i, I don't think you'd appreciate me talking about him as well i don't want to make him look bad because he's not a bad guy It's just that we had some disagreements that really kind of parted us from the from the journey. From what I can take from this, every time we've mentioned Abdul, you always put him in a really good light. You never want to say bad things about him. Is that does that come back to your faith again about because you know in the heat of the moment you do things and in, when your back is against the wall, you have to make a decision either this or that. So maybe in fact I didn't make the decision Abdul made the decision for me going away from the from the project but he, again you know we were family friends we became family friends and and you know he was a good good friend I really enjoyed the company it was it was it was good fun so i always look at the good side of people i like to look at the good side i don't like to burn any bridges i even reached out to him you know to see if he's interested in you know 
talking and you know maybe just being friends again how did that go mm, not very well <laughs> can you describe the, I sent the a conversation message, I think, about a year and a half or two years ago saying hey you know let's just put, put it behind us and just you know and at what, least stay in touch and what was his response um i think he was shocked that i'm i'm still messaging and and he didn't know which way to take maybe he thought okay what does he want now yeah. okay let's go back to um your strategy you've you've gone from long haul flights to short haul flights who were the first few airports you spoke to hmm. funny interesting you say that because there's a lot of question marks around my negotiations with with airports and and each negotiation has a long story and history behind it so we were visiting Luton airport once and it was still at that time talking about long haul ambition and in the middle of long haul and regional long haul and regional to park the long haul aspect and going for the regional aspect and then the guy from Luton he was saying hey you know you guys want to you might want to consider this route and there's a company that used to fly it before they don't fly it anymore it's called VLM Airlines they used to fly Luton Waterford and there's a huge community that require this service to connect to be connected to London and in fact I had one investor who's from Waterford who heard that we wanted to do something with Waterford and she kind of backed the project with her own hard earned money so there was a group of people I would say about 100,000 150,000 or so wanted to connect direct to uh, to London because if you look at the map Well Waterford was in between so you had Cork on one way and then Dublin on the other way it's like 2 hours 2 and a half hours distance and people of Waterford they wanted to kind of connect to L- L- London Luton or any of the London airports directly and VLM used to serve it they don't serve it anymore not because the route wasn't profitable route did make sense but the company because of other other problems in other network they kind of went i think under um fun fact Ryanair was the airport that launched from Waterford airport back in 1985 oh, wow. connecting Waterford to Gatwick with a Embraer 15 seater aircraft it's an amazing story Ryanair and um yeah so that l- person in Luton commercial team said you might want to speak to these guys and see you know if they're willing to you know entertain a conversation where you guys because you guys want to do regional see if you guys can get something going between Luton and that way we can back you they can back you and it's a very good business case and you could at least start off with something as opposed to nothing so we thought our model has always been unserved or underserved routes these are the kind of opportunities we're looking for underserved or unserved routes that made sense for a startup company it may not make sense for a big company because they've got a bigger kind of um bigger operation and certain operations don't make sense so for example with some of our sunnah mas locations we wouldn't do um branches in a certain location if it didn't make a certain amount of money because our operational infrastructure would take too much money to run this operation so we would rather not do it at all So I guess same way airlines don't do certain routes but on the other hand it will make for a, a sense for a startup because they've got smaller teams smaller costs and they can focus on on those particular routes. So we made an inquiry with Waterford Airport and we said hey you know we're looking to do this you know would love to have a meeting and you know have a conversation. We had our Zoom call preliminary talks and then they invited us over to to go and see them. And at that point after meeting them my worry was in europe right anyone can fly anywhere there is no no one stopping from flying from this route to that route just because fernas is now serving luton to waterford doesn't mean someone else can't come in the same route maybe someone else will see okay if these guys can do it then you know let's wipe them out and and that's a common thread in aviation that it turns into a bloodbath you know when one company sees this company is doing well the mighty operators would say you know what we've got the resources and infrastructure they've made the route wo- route work we'll just take them out and we'll take the route so they will like start a price war and you will be 
very soon out of business because they've got the cash flow to back it up. One of the challenges with uh, Waterford was, and this is why Ryanair and EasyJet wouldn't fly into Waterford because the runway length was not long enough for a Ryanair or EasyJet or for that matter even BA for one of the aircraft to safely take off with the full load. So they were in talks of expanding the runway but that was a very political thing in Waterford and it, it, it just kind of got stuck along the way. So it needed a small aircraft, small plane with a small kind of load and we thought if we can make this work then this is it. This is our kind of starting point and I guess that kind of triggered to uh, to reposition from uh, Sharia compliance because Waterford and Ireland they're known for you know drinking a lot of alcohol not that we were going to serve alcohol or, or, or anything but at least the cultures yeah really at match. least kind of not make them kind of um, wary of of the operation um, or the safety of the operation because people associate uh, I guess uh, Sharia with unsafety um, these days um, so my worry was I'm going to do all the legwork I'm going to do all the hard work give me some reassurance Mr. Waterford or the Waterford airport that if you decide because of the open, open sky policies if you decide to allow somebody else to come in then you at least give me some reassurance and guarantee that you know we're not going to shaft you we're not going to we're going to we're, we're not going to kind of do you guys over because it's quite common i've seen time and time again reading news and stories and it was happening you know where ryanair would uh, finish maybe some other people's routes and vice versa so yeah um, i wanted some reassurance that's all it is so it came across in the documentary as if I'm asking them for, for a bribe. And I guess the whole narrative of bribe and me being a brown skinned guy coming from Bangladesh, it kind of fit that narrative quite well. But it wasn't a bribe. I wasn't asking for them to give me money. I was just asking them, look, don't give me the money. Put it somewhere else. Put it in an escrow. But I want that reassurance that you guys are not going to mess me over because of the open sky policies. Anyone can fly in. And um, they agreed up to 125k euros to be you know, escrowed to, to somewhere else, just so if they default on some of their agreements or some of the arrangements that they come with uh, to us with, there's a level of safety. There's a there. level of safety. So that was the narrative. But in the documentary, 47 minutes long, you can't, I guess, get all the essences across why 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 did i ask waterford for money it wasn't because i wanted them to invest or or or, or some uh, money, money that i would put in my pocket no absolutely not and in fact to prove my point they did mess us over in a sense that you'll see in the documentary where waterford turns around and said oh we're not entertaining this anymore they did, and they, the Channel 4 documentary covered that. And the reason behind that is someone else came in the mix. In the middle of Firnas, someone else came in the mix and offered the same solution. Oh, wow. Same exact solution. And it was in conjunction with the airport, that one. So the airport had a massive, massive kind of role to play. It was a, a company called Air Southeast. A E R Southeast, so they they somehow set up a booking platform. They got the aircraft ready, and they had connections. Some of the people behind, I know them, and and, and I still speak to them. That we're we're good friends, um, and they had the setup going faster than we could. I couldn't get the capital ready, and I couldn't move fast enough. And these other guys, because they had the connections and 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 everything lined up, they got the aircraft ready. They've got the booking platform ready, and they were on sale. Waterford, Luton, blah, 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 this price and that price. And on the first day, they made so much money. No way. They made like, I think on the first few hours of opening the platform, they sold like 50K or something worth of tickets. Is that still active now? No. And what happened was the Irish authorities, they found some, some irregularities in the whole setup. They said either you get a license from us 
that we will approve based on all the kind of requirements which is we want to see your capital adequacy and we want to see who these people are so there's a lot of kind of things involved in order to get a license but there are other ways that you can still set up a route where you get somebody else somebody else to operate that route for you but with them it was n n neither of the of the situations were the case they didn't have any of them so they didn't have the license from the Irish authorities, nor did they have a, another operator with a sufficient license or a proper license to operate that route. It was kind of in the grey zone. So the Irish authorities clamped down. They said, nope, you've got you to stop selling, close the booking platform, and you've got to refund all the monies. So that, I guess, proved the point that I wasn't madman to ask for a certain reassurance because exactly what happened afterwards and the route I guess was viable but because of the technical technical issues they were shut down the whole operation and if anyone wants to do some digging then they can um, look into Air Southeast AER Southeast and you can go on the news section of Google and you'll see what happened there. I want to clarify something that was mentioned in the documentary so they suggested that you made a bribe to the Watford Airport. Did you also offer shares to the civil servants? No. So it's not Watford. It's Waterford. I always, uh, we always get confused and Waterford people don't like us calling Watford because I kind of said something along the lines of Watford and some of the investors really got angry around it because what would you mean? Like, you can't associate like that. <laughs> um, so that's that. Um, no. Again, it was around security. I said, look, if you guys think I'm going to do the opposite, that I'm going to mess you guys over, then again, reserve some shareholding in the company so I don't do anything that will kind of impact your interests. So it was a kind of a two-way thing. And these conversations can be verified through emails. We've got loads of emails exchanges where I'm saying, look, it wasn't... I'm going to give you shares and you give me a bribe and that's it. And, you know, we're in business. It wasn't, it was nothing like that. It came across like that because of the time constraints of the documentary. Um, but no, it wasn't free shares so they can give me the money. No, absolutely not. It was more around security, open sky policies. Anyone can fly in. And as a result, someone did come, did, did come in and I was out of the picture very fast. So I wanted reassurance. That's all, I, that's all that was. I wanted protection and reassurance that they're not going to mess me over. This is a highly regulated business with loads of bureaucracy. You've got to deal with different departments and so on. In the documentary, you mentioned that it's costing you money every single day. Can you expand on that yeah. a bit? Oh my God, that's a long, six month long story. Six months so where I said inside the aircraft hangar, oh, like, you know, what are you guys doing? You know, so they came, my team kept on coming up with new ideas and new solutions and suggestions on, on how we can do this. So one on one side, we're getting the aircraft, we're signing um, the lease of an aircraft. And on the other side, so my goal was, look, we're a British company, we're based in the UK, our home is London. We're going to go to the London authorities, the civil aviation authorities of the UK to get, get our license. But I think um, the aircraft owner, he knew or he felt that because his aircraft is known to the authorities, we may face some challenges. And as a result, we may not continue with the lease of the aircraft. So he kept on pushing with another idea. And he was supposed to be our flight operations person as well. So he was a trained training captain and examiner. So it, he came as a package. So he came with the aircraft and he came as a person that we can rely on on all flight operations. So you need five key persons, persons for a license to be approved. You need the accountable manager, a person who's accountable for, for the entire thing. You need a f director of flight operations. So we thought the aircraft owner, he's a captain, he's, he knows he owned this aircraft for a very long time. So he can manage all of that flight operations. And then you need, a, you, need a, you, need a, you need a director of ground operations. You need a security, safety and compliance. 
So I guess I think uh, and 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 something called camo. Um, they are the continuous airworthiness management people. So with aviation, nothing is left question in a question mark zone. Nothing is grey. It's either yes or no. It's either you know red or green. There is nothing in between because of the safety aspect of the of of, of uh, it's the nature of the of the business. You know, as soon as an aircraft takes off, that's it. You're in lo the mercy of all the systems in place. So everything had to be done properly. So yeah, we were looking for the team members and he fit that bill, he fit that criteria and we thought, you know what, sounds good. But he kept on pushing for something else. And what he was pushing for is us going to Malta and setting up in Malta. And in aviation, in the documentary, you will not see anything to do with Malta. Is there a reason why? It's probably because, the, again, there was no time and it just didn't fit the kind of storyline. So in that um, hangar, they kept on saying, look, let's go Malta. Let's set up in Malta. Let's set up the company in Malta. And Maltese are very easy to work with. They're, they're looking for operators to open. That's their goal. And our goal is to open. And they're looking for the authorities are more entrepreneurial over there, less bureaucratic, less resistant. So let's set up in Malta. You know, it's still a British kind of, I guess, colony or British system. You know, we'll go out and, and set up in Malta. And I thought, look, you guys need to really stop changing all these plans and stop coming up with new ideas. Let's just focus on one and let's just go for it. Do you think he had a bit of conflict of interest? I think so. I think so. Really, Later, his, alter, his real goal was really just to lease his plane. Yeah. So I think it, there was ulterior motives and, and uh, some of my team members should have really backed me as opposed to the other idea. And I think at some point, I guess, because of so many logics that was coming across, me, I said, you know, what? OK, let's go. You know, if if by going and setting up in Malta, I'm going to save three months of time of waiting around with the UK authorities, then you know what? We'll make up the time. So, yeah, we 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 agreed to go Malta. And I said to them in that um, scene, said, look, if you come back to me with a solid plan on how we're going to do Malta and how it's going to benefit, then we'll we'll consider it. Otherwise, it's costing me money every day. You guys are talking about new plans and I have to keep paying for certain things. We're not making progress. We're just kind of standing around and I didn't want to do that. So finally, we agreed to go Malta and, and, and sooner or later, I realized, sugar, I'm in a no man's land. I'm not even known. Nobody knows who the hell I am here. At least in, in the UK, you, you've got some presence, you know some MPs, you know some ministers through some contacts, and you know, you've got some relationship. With Malta, you're like completely new. Like nobody knows who you are. Not even the authorities know who you are. You set up a new brand new company. You're coming from Britain. First of all, the question is, why are you even coming here? You've got Britain, you've got the British authorities. Go to them. Why here? Like, it's not like you guys are doing this as a strategic move because of Brexit and because of all that was happening around Brexit because there was so many changes with um, you know, the, the air law and, and, and all the regulations around um, airspace. So I guess um, the question mark that we later realized from the Maltese point of view was why are you even coming here? If you were like a global company with offices all around the world, you know, in Dubai, in London, in America, then setting up another base in Malta is like another kind of exercise. It's a paper exercise. Like Ryanair and other people went and set up in Malta just before, before, before um, the Brexit happened. A lot of these companies, they went out and set up offices and licenses in Malta so they can exercise the European rights, traffic rights, as well as the UK traffic rights. So they've got both sides covered. But with us, that wasn't even the kind of thing. You guys are new. You guys are fresh. You guys are coming to Malta. Why? And I guess that was the question that we, we, we really struggled to answer to the authorities over there. And these are very smart people. The director of um, aviation directorate in, in Malta. They're, they're, very, they're all connected. Like I said, they're all connected. It just takes, I, I suppose he can just WhatsApp. Uh, you know, his counterpart in the UK and say, yo, do you guys know these people? Like, why are they even here? So with aviation licensing, there is a framework and it's a framework that is followed all around the world. It's, it doesn't matter if you're getting a license from Bangladesh 
or the UK. The, the, the framework is set up by IATA and ICAO and, and I guess some things are adjusted based on the country and, and, the, and the authorities or the local civil aviation authorities. But generally the framework is same all around the world. So you have to do pre-application meeting. So you have to submit an interest to get a license and then they invite you for a pre-application meeting just to kind of feel you out to see who you, what you are about, you know, who you are, what you do. And then if they are happy with everything, then they will invite you to submit a proper formal application. So we set up a, the limited company in, in Malta, that took forever. That took so much, honestly, unnecessary energy out of me um, setting up a company in Malta. Let me take you slightly back. One aspect that I faced a challenge with was setting up a bank account for an aviation company. Nobody wants to give you a bank account. Whether it's HSBC, lawyers, TSB, Barclays, nobody wants to know anything to do with airline. Anything, I guess it's not just airline, anything that where you can't render the service immediately as an exchange, anything that relies on you to offer the service maybe three months down the line. And that's probably one of the reasons why nobody wants to bank with airlines. So I somehow managed to convince one of the bank, UK banks um, to give me an account. But then that was the same thing was repeat in Malta. Like, Okay, we set up the company. It's easy to set up a company. You get a guy, you know, a, a formation company, they'll set it up for you. They will also assist you in with, with the bank setup as well. But, gosh, the amount of stuff they were requiring to open that bank account was so, so what tedious. What sort of stuff do they want? Everything. They want to know everything. You know, what your business plan is, how you're going to do this, you know, what are your protocols. You know, they want to make sure that you're not going to take money from people passengers and then they have to at the end because you went bust they have to hold the bags nobody wants to be in that position so i guess that's where the resistance is so to cut the story short we set up the company in malta we set up the limited company we even went for the pre-application meeting and all of that and bam again you know that was i think one or two years after the brexit happened so Brexit happened around, I think, 2016 and beginning of 2018, that's when all the the laws, the change of laws were coming into force between the UK and the European authorities, whatever they've, they've agreed, because it wasn't open sky anymore between UK and, 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 and Europe. So there was loads of changes and the Maltese authorities, they used that as an excuse to push us back, say, look, um, we've had a directive from the European Commission that we cannot process any new applications. And unfortunately, you got, you're, you're on that category of new applications. And as such, we're not going to entertain this any further. Where does that leave me? I'm like in devast devastation. Now I don't even have the UK authorities, nor do I have the Maltese authority. Where do I go? I've got an aircraft that I've, that's on ground lease. I've got a team that I need to pay for. And the money is running out fast. There's the fundraising aspect and there's internal issues like, again, with Brother Abdul, like there's some instabilities that was happening. So the problems were from all directions. And I tried to figure out why, why are Maltese authorities saying this? Why? Because I want to know, I want to get to the bottom of this. Why? And um, they weren't answering. They weren't even willing to meet us. So I flew out to Malta. I wanted to really go on this Mission Impossible kind of journey to find out what's going on. So I got some locals involved, like local businessmen who are in aviation and who know the, avi the director of aviation in the authority personally, who can call up and say, look, this Kazi guy wants to meet you. So they somehow lined up a meeting for us. I went with my team and um, he's, he's a captain. He's a former captain, but he's the director of um, aviation over there and he said look there's too many questions mark around your your whole thing first of all what is sharia compliant anyway he did bring that up and and all of this just sounds a bit strange to me and 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 you know i really need to think this through before i even you know give you guys a formal answer and in between that the funny thing is honestly it's, uh, 
I guess it was just meant to be that way. Our captain, the person who's supposed to be the director of flight operation, he's like speaking to the other person as if he's that, that's his boy. Like, come on, uh, the person referring to the person, you know, man to man, you know, captain to captain, you know, what's going on? He did not appreciate that tone of language. He expressed his dissatisfaction straight away on an email. And then I tried to f um, resort to the British authorities in Malta to, to find out for me why are they doing this to me. You know, I'm not satisfied with the answer. I'm not getting the clear cut answer. It's either no here nor there. Like, they're just buying time. They weren't giving us a clear, crystal clear no. It was just kind of wooshy washy. But the gist that you're supposed to get is no. Um, so I contacted the British High Commission in, in Malta. I met up with the High Commissioner. He said, look, I'll try and do some call, make some calls and find out what's going on. And again, they were getting the same response. And I think the more I was doing this, the more annoyed the director of aviation was getting getting so the more i pushed the more he was getting annoyed he was just trying to get rid of us um and then um i've met one lady and um, she's very connected in maltese aviation space and she said hey kazi like what's going on man you know let me see if i can help you she was so nice she's so like honestly and then she went in and she contacted that captain again the director of uh, flight uh, the, the authority and said hey Charles like oops I shouldn't say the, oh, say the name <laughs> might need to uh, call that out. yeah um, what's going on just give us a clear cut answer and he opened up completely and she got a list of things that was wrong and then I said yeah it made sense can you run us through the list of things? I can't remember I can't remember from the top of my head but uh, it was around those unprofessionalism the unprofessionalism and the the questions mark around why are you even coming here? You know, you've got British authorities, a British aircraft. Why are you even changing the aircraft to our registration? And why are you like making a mess out of the situation? There's no just, structure. You're yeah, like go back, changing. go to the, if you want a license, go to the British authorities. Then that means you're, about, you're trying to hide something. And um, I guess that was a problem. And um, that's when I realized it's not happening. Like I've lost faith in that and that's by then it was already like I think 2018 of of 2018 of uh, uh sorry July June July of 2018 and um I thought you know what forget it forget motor it's not happening back to the UK back to the authorities and, and at that point that's when I said listen I'm not listening to anybody anymore I am going to follow my intuition and I'm going to do what what I think based on what I've read is right. And I said, look, we're going to the British authorities, whether anyone likes it or not, we're going to submit an application and let's get it ready. And that's what we've done. And then, um, yeah, if you want to know more about it, I suppose I'll have to, we'll have to do another, another episode continuing from, from what happened from meeting the British authorities to, to the point where it all came to some sort of a grinding halt just before, before pandemic. Um, guys, if you have been enjoying um, today's episode um, with the Q&A around Firnas and, and what went on, um, please um, comment below if you have any questions, of course, and I'll happily answer them. And of course, share this video with anyone that you think might be interested in learning about Firnas and the journey that took place and the documentary and busting some myths around some of the documentary scenes. Uh, and on that note, please don't forget to subscribe help us grow this channel so we can get some amazing guests in our future podcast and share some amazing stories and on that note i'll see you guys very soon